And we'll go ahead. Um, welcome to Endeavor and welcome Latita, president of the Winston-Salem Foundation. We're happy to have you with us today and we're happy to have all of our attendees with us today as well. We'll go around the room and do really quick introductions of ourselves so that we can um, all get to know one another in this virtual environment. Typically we're together for lunch and can't be today because of the snow or maybe COVID, whatever your case may be. But thank you for making the effort to be with us today online. Um, I am going to go around and just call on folks to introduce themselves. I am Andrea Howell. I am a partner here at Flywheel and the director of community networks, which means I manage the staff and operations at now our two locations here in Winston-Salem and in Concord, um, North Carolina and soon Greenville, South Carolina. And that is all about me. I'm just really looking forward um, to learning more about the Winston-Salem Foundation today. And I will call on Tyra. Hello everyone, I am Tyra McCorko. My name looks like Tyria, but it's pronounced Tyra. I am the owner and founder of McCorko Laboratories Enterprise. We are a new drug testing uh, center, mobile center. And I'm here curious to learn more about the Winston-Salem Foundation over the past six, seven years. My daytime job, which is Department of Homeland Security, keeps me on the road, so I'm unfamiliar with what's going on in my community and hope to get back involved soon. Thank you. Thank you, Tyra. Ann Garvey. Hey everyone, Ann Garvey, Director of Fund Administration and Stewardship at Winston-Salem Foundation. And I'm here to cheer on Latita and to absorb information. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Let's go to Ingrid. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Ingrid Bentel. I'm the Director of Impact at United Way Foresight. I'm new to Winston-Salem, transplant from New York City, been here for 90 days, and I'm very excited to learn lots of things that are happening in Winston-Salem. Welcome, Ingrid. Welcome to Winston. Glad to have you. Hope we'll, we'll be seeing you at many events. Lisa Purcell. Hi, I'm Lisa Purcell. I'm the Executive Vice President at the Winston-Salem Foundation uh, here, Team Latita. And I <laughs> really wanted to know a little bit more about Flywheel and Endeavor and your luncheons, because this is the first one I've attended. Fantastic. Thank you so much for coming. And then our own Erin McHugh. Hello, um, my name is Erin. I am the new community manager at Flywheel, working for Andrea. Um, so this is my first Endeavor luncheon, and I'm really excited to learn more about the Winston-Salem Foundation and hear what Latita is going to bring to the table and bring to my hometown. So I love it. Fantastic. I think we made a really good decision on our new community manager. We're very happy to have Erin. I'm Taja. Hi, everyone. I couldn't get off mute fast enough. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. Well, I guess it's almost afternoon. I am Taja Gaiman. I'm the director of uh, corporate engagement at United Way. I was invited by Ingrid and also looking forward to hearing more from the new president of the Winston-Salem Foundation. And um learn a little bit more about Flywheel. This is too is my first luncheon, so glad to be here. Fantastic. It's great to see so many new faces. Meredith. Hi everyone, I'm Meredith Whitaker and I am also with the Winston-Salem Foundation. My role is Director of Philanthropic Services. Um, so like my colleagues have said, just wanted to um, you know, participate in one of these luncheons for the first time and also um, learn um, more from Latita. Fantastic. Deborah Perret. Good morning, afternoon, everybody. I'm Deborah Pere. I have my own consulting company, Aspire, Inspire, Achieve, and I coach uh, small businesses and nonprofits um, in communications, marketing, and public relations. 
And I'm not sure about this, but I think I'm either the first or the second female member of Flywheel since it was launched. <laughs> Thank you, Deborah. Kevin. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin Bitterman, and I'm the executive director of the Thomas S. Keenan Institute for the Arts, which is a division of the North Carolina School of the Arts. Um, Ingrid, like you, I'm a relatively new member to the community. I, I uh, moved here officially in August, so um, I'm, uh, I'm glad to not be the only new person as, uh, as well as Latilda as well. Um, uh, I'm really here just to get to know more uh, about the work of the foundation. I see Jonathan Halsey, who I do know, um, but also uh, the Thomas S. Keenan Institute for the Arts is in residence in the 500 West 5th Street building. Uh, we're on the third floor um, at the university floor. So I haven't had a chance to really connect with Flywheel that much, but uh, I'm looking forward to that in the year to come. Thank you for organizing and moving to the virtual space. Thank you. Hi, neighbor. I'll pop on down and say hi. <laughs> Stephen Edwards, welcome. Tell us about yourself. Hey, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Stephen Edwards. Uh, work uh, with Baird Private Wealth Management um, in uh, Winston-Salem and uh, also a Flywheel Foundation board member. Um, so passionate about the work of Flywheel and the work of the foundation and enjoy the Endeavor lunches, um, both in person and virtual, though in person, certainly more fun. Um, and yeah, just looking forward to learning uh, more about, um, yeah, the vision for the foundation this year and, and years to come and the continued great work within our community of over a hundred plus years. And so what, what's to come for, for next and how all of us can partner with you in it. Thanks, Stephen. Um, thanks for being a fantastic board member for the Flywheel Foundation. And maybe um, later on we can share with the crowd um, a little more about the Flywheel Foundation as well. Rick Leander, also a board member, is here as well. Um, and find ways we can all work together. Hi, Cece Fulton. Hi. <coughs> Excuse me. Hi, Andrea. It's been a long time since I've seen you. Um, Great to see you, even if it's virtual. Um, I am also with the Winston-Salem Foundation and Director of Marketing Communications. So definitely here uh, for Team Latita. Um, and just we look forward. I've not been to one of um, your luncheons and looking forward to hearing more about a little bit more about what Flywheel has been up to. So thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Uh, let's see, Nay Coleman. Hello. Hi, my name is Naja Coleman. Um, I'm an actor, writer, and I work for High Point University. Um, I'm an assistant director for the Center for Community Engagement. Um, we're a newly grant funded center at High Point, and I'm just really looking forward to hearing more about what the Winston Salem Foundation is doing. Um, I'm very excited to get more connected. I moved to Winston a year into the pandemic, and so it still feels like I'm pretty new, um, even though I've been here for a while. Welcome, welcome. Hopefully we'll see you in person soon. Um, Lisa Purcell. Oh, I already called on Lisa. Did I already call on Lisa? I did already call on Lisa. <laughs> They're moving around now. Um, oh, Janae. Hello, everybody. Um, I am Janae Adams. I am the owner of Adet Sucks University. So I teach financial literacy to middle school, high school, and college students around the country, as well as in Canada, um, other parts of the world as well. So I'm glad to be here. I just wanted to learn more about what the foundation is doing to not only what initiatives you all have, not only to close the, the wealth gap, but also the racial wealth gap within Winston-Salem. So I'm glad to be here. Thank you for coming. It's been a while since I've seen you as well. Good to see you. And Jonathan Halsey. Hello, Jonathan Halsey. I'm the philanthropic advisor at the Winston-Salem Foundation. Um, also on Team Latita today. Um, but uh, I remember when Flywheel was um, nothing but a dream in Peter's head. So it's great okay. for me to participate in my first luncheon as well and learn more about your programming. So thank you. 
Thank you so much for joining us. It says a lot about your own community there at the Winston-Salem Foundation, Latita, that you have so many of your own folks here to support you today. That's really heartwarming. Let's see, who haven't I? Deborah Smith, hello. Hello, Andrea. Good to hear your voice and see you. Um, my name is Deborah Smith, and I'm the CEO of Early Groove. We're a software platform and community directory dedicated to connecting people to local information and resources to help improve, empower, and enrich lives. You can check us out online at earlygroove.com. Thank you so much. Um, and someone I've exchanged emails with but haven't met yet, Layla Warren. Hello, everyone. I am uh, Leela Warren, and uh, I am the executive uh, assistant at the Winston-Salem Foundation. And I was not familiar with Flywheel prior to receiving your emails, Andrea. So I am delighted to finally learn more about that and also to support Latita in her um, as the featured speaker today. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Rick Leander, we are uh, here. Good to, afternoon, Rick. We good are afternoon. here to learn more about the Winston Salem Foundation, but Rick, feel free to um, expand a little bit on the Winston on the uh, Flywheel Foundation. <laughs> sure. Um, I am uh, first of all. I'm the. Uh, uh, I lead the team at uh, LFB Holdings. We are Behavioral Insights Consultancy. About half of our work is with startups and early stage companies. Um, our work is right now, it's just national. It used to be global before the, the pandemic hit. Um, about half of our work is with startups and early stage companies. And so as part of that, I sit on the board of the Flywheel Foundation. I'm also sit on the board of the Center for Creative Economy. I'm uh, part of the um, uh, mentor advisory group at Winston Starts. So heavily involved with the entrepreneurial community here. Um, the Winston, uh, the Flywheel Foundation is responsible for um, funding the education programs that we then deliver through primarily through the Flywheel infrastructure. So the various programs that you are involved in um, and see as part of our training and education and uh, community awareness programs are all funded with money that the foundation uh, runs and so Stephen and I and a and a handful of other people are really focused on trying to make sure that we've got a really good funding stream so that we continue to provide really good content for the the organizations that Flywheel supports. Um, and along with the pitch for the Flywheel Foundation, the reason I'm here today is I'm really interested in hearing the plans for how the Winston Salem Foundation can really leverage up the work that we're doing in the entrepreneurial. Um, arena here in Winston-Salem because it really is critical. So um, I, I know that um, some work has already begun in that area, but I'm really interested in hearing some details and the plans for the future. Thanks. Thank you, Rick. Um, let's see, oh, Randon has joined us. Hi, Randon. Can you go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us who you are and what you're hoping to get today? Good morning, yes, Randon Pender. I am the immediate past president of the Winston-Salem Black Chamber of Commerce, and I'm retired nurse case manager in the workers' comp industry. And uh, just happy to have uh, Ms. Latita Smith in our community, excited about what the future holds for, <clears throat> for the mission that she has and the mission that uh, our community organizations have, and we'll be a better community because of it. So. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Randon. <clears throat> okay, let's see, almost finished. Magalie, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Magalie Yacinth. I am the Executive Director of Hustle Winston-Salem, which is a nonprofit organization that is focused on inclusive entrepreneurship. And we are at Flywheel. Um, was there another question? what you're hoping to get oh. out of our chat today. I'm sorry, y'all. It, I know it's Tuesday, but I swear I feel, I feel like it's Friday afternoon. Um, 
I am just coming back from recovering from COVID. So it's it's just been a terrible week. Um, I am hoping to just hear more from Latita. I had the opportunity to sit in one of the sessions a few weeks ago. Um, I guess it's been a few months now since she's done it. So I have heard some of the plans and I'm excited. And I just thought it was a great opportunity to support. Thanks for joining us. Yep. Glad you're getting better. Thank you. And Misty Gabriel, another person I haven't seen in a while. Yeah, hello. And sorry, I won't be um, sharing my my lovely mug on, on uh, video today because I'm a little bit in between locations. But um, anyway, Misty Gabriel, I work for Beta Verde with Margaret Northfleet Neff. Um, we're probably most known here in Winston-Salem for uh, operating the Cobblestone Farmer's Market as, where, as well as a small shared use kitchen. Um, but we, in the last five years, have um, worked on adaptive reuse development projects with a company out of Baltimore. And so we do projects all over the country. But here in Winston-Salem, we're working on two buildings uh, on Marshall Street, 1001 and 1007 South Marshall. And now that we've sort of gotten some more footing underneath of us from all the pivoting of the last two years, um, we are doing a lot of intentional outreach and reconnecting with folks um, here in the community just to keep um, sharing about what we're doing and understanding what resources are needed, what resources are out there, and sort of how we can keep being a connective tissue for those things as we move forward with activating the spaces that we're working on. Um, so yeah, just uh, like everyone wanted to join and, and just kind of listen in and understand um, what plans are in motion and, and think about how those things can connect and, um, and maybe dovetail with a lot of exciting things we have uh, on our list for 2022. So looking forward to learning more. Fantastic. And last, I don't, there is a phone number. I'm not sure if this is someone who's logged in both on video and phone, but the last four digits are 4201. If that is you and you would like to introduce yourself, that would be great. Okay, someone just listening in. Um, well, welcome to all of you. And yes, it looks like we got everyone. Welcome to all of you. And um, we will go now to Latita Smith and, and the, the general format, Latita and I talked, Latita and Aaron and I talked um, before this to talk about um, kind of format. And typically we just let um, our guests speak about the history of their organization and what they have coming up. Um, what they hope for the future, current initiatives, and most importantly, towards the end, how we all can help and how we can be contributors to the organization um, and get involved in, in our local community a little deeper than we currently are. So Latita, I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. And thank you all for taking time out of your day today. I really appreciate it. It's great to have the opportunity to meet all of you and share the work that we're engaged in at the Winston-Salem Foundation and talk about how we might work together um, in the future. Um, I know that Zoom fatigue is real, and so I really do appreciate you taking the time to make this happen. Um, I'm Latita Smith, and I am the fifth president of the 102-year-old Winston-Salem Foundation. Um, I'm brand new to North Carolina, so not as new as Ingrid, but a little bit newer than, was it Stephen or someone else I saw? Because uh, then Kevin, yes, you moved on my screen, a little bit newer uh, than Kevin. But um, I came here most recently from Scranton, Pennsylvania, where I spent the last um, six years leading a health foundation there, um, but I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. So as you can imagine, my kids were quite amused by the fact that they had a snow day today, although they were not complaining, we'll take it. Um, and I came to this position most directly because a friend in philanthropy, who's actually a Flywheel member, sent me the posting and encouraged me to take a look at what was happening here in this amazing community. Um, but I couldn't be more grateful because it came at the absolute right time for me. 
Um, I was really looking for a different place to do philanthropy and to do the kind of work in philanthropy that um, matters most to me. And I was also looking for a different kind of place to raise my children. I have a son who's 11 and a daughter who's eight and community matters a lot to us. Um, and we hadn't quite found our place in Northeast Pennsylvania. So we were delighted to come here and find in this community, both the professional opportunity that I was looking for, as well as just an amazing place to raise our children, which really mattered most to my family. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the history and the present work of the foundation. Um, Andrea warned me that this is an, an informal group, so you all feel free to interrupt me and ask for more information and clarity if I can provide it. Um, I'm now, what is it, five months, or this is my fifth month on the job, so I know enough to be dangerous, but I am very well supported by my amazing colleagues who like get to talk to me all the time and yet still took time to spend lunch with us today. And so um, I will, um, without shame, um, call on any of them to help me um, if there's additional information that I can't provide. But we're just excited to share with you the work that we're doing together with other partners in the community to strengthen Forsyth County. So the Winston-Salem Foundation was established in October of 1919. So we were 102 years old last October. We celebrated our centennial just a couple of years ago. And at that time, we were the oldest foundation of any type in North Carolina. And we remain one of the 50 largest community foundations in the United States, which is amazing. And I think that it speaks to the considerable wealth and generosity that exists in this community. And at the same time, what we think a lot about is the considerable and persistent need that also exists in this community and how we marry the two. Our mission is to inspire giving and link resources to action to strengthen Forsyth County. And we do that work primarily in four ways. Through philanthropic services, we partner with generous donors and organizations to help them meet their charitable goals. And we have a range of services to support donors in supporting the organizations that they care about the most, the causes that matter to them, and also to work with people who are interested in supporting the issues that the foundation prioritizes. And so happy to describe that in further detail, but philanthropic services, really leveraging the charitable interests of folks across our community is a primary way that we work to achieve our mission. The second way that we um, achieve our mission is through community grant making. And those are the dollars that our foundation directs to the areas that we have prioritized as being both the greatest needs, as well as holding the greatest opportunity in Forsyth County. And right now our priorities are advancing equity and education and building an inclusive economy. So when it comes to advancing equity and education, we're really interested in asking, what will it take for our school district and our community to work together to provide comprehensive support for students, especially those from marginalized groups. And when it comes to building an inclusive economy, we're really interested in asking, what will it take to ensure that Forsyth County has inclusive systems and has pathways for economic opportunity for all families, but particularly ensuring that families of color are economically stable and that they experience high rates of economic mobility. So those are the two areas that the foundation prioritizes in the resources that we ourselves direct. The fourth way that we work in our community is through student aid. And we provide student aid, both merit-based as well as need-based student aid to local students across our community. Last year, we awarded over 600 scholarships to local students totaling over $1.4 million. And we're really, really proud of this work. We have a application um, that's available on our website and it provides one single point of access so that students don't have to fill out a myriad of applications, but there's one way that they can um, provide their um, application and be eligible for the myriad of scholarship funds that the foundation manages for a whole host of interests. 
And I'll talk later about ways you can get involved with the foundation, but one really key way that we often seek volunteers are people who are interested in reviewing scholarship applications. Um, that's a need that we have every year and we welcome that interest if that's something that you might be, um, have an interest in um, participating in. And then the fourth way that we work in our community is through our strategic initiatives. And our initiatives, um, our Black Philanthropy Initiative, our Youth Grant Makers in Action, and our Women's Fund are initiatives through which we engage target populations, both in collective giving and collective learning and helping to design solutions to address the unique challenges that those communities face. Undergirding all of our work, you may have heard, is our deep commitment to advancing racial equity. Um, we recognize that many of the challenges that our community faces have roots in historic and systemic inequities. And so we are working to specifically target, um, explore, understand, and remedy those racial inequities so that we might help to build a stronger Forsyth County. And that is a through line through all of the foundation's work. Um, when I think about um, the future of the foundation, we are really committed to continuing to work um, nimbly and flexibly to address um, both the immediate challenges that our community faces, as well as looking toward where future opportunities exist. And so we welcome the opportunity to partner with nonprofits, to partner with donors, to partner with volunteers so that we might better understand what are those emerging issues and continue to ensure that our strategies are aligning with the areas that the community prioritizes as being of greatest interest to it. And I think one of the reasons why the foundation is such a critical part of the fabric of our community is that now more than ever, we really appreciate the importance of community. And I think that um, one of the silver linings of COVID is that we've come to understand how very much each of our well being is connected to one another. And so we are committed to ensuring that while we're not battling the same problems 102 years from now that we're battling today, that we are continuing to work in community with one another. Um, to dedicate resources, um, to listen and learn from one another and plan together about how we might better um, address the challenges that we collectively face. And so there are a range of ways that you can become involved with the foundation. Um, we certainly welcome the opportunity to work with you um, to achieve your own um, charitable goals. And so if you have an interest in establishing a fund at the foundation or supporting a scholarship or supporting the foundation's general work, we always rec um, value those opportunities to partner together. Um, there are also wonderful opportunities to be part of any of our initiatives. So our Youth Grant Makers in Action Initiative is for high school students. So that's, I would imagine, not available to um, any of you, but we welcome that opportunity if you know other high schoolers who might be interested in learning more about our community and in learning more about philanthropy. But our Women's Fund and our Black Philanthropy Initiative, um, our collective giving initiatives um, welcome your participation. And so there's a relatively low um, interest, uh, a low interest um, for both of those, if that's something that you would be interested in participating in. And we um, would value the opportunity to have um, both your um, talents as well as your resources to support those efforts. And then I mentioned that we also value volunteers. And so um, reading for um, one of our student aid programs is always a way um, every year that donors can, I mean, that um, volunteers can dedicate a finite amount of time um, in order to contribute to the foundation's work and learn more about the community um, in the meantime. And so in a nutshell, that's the work of the foundation. And that um, describes the ways that we work to collectively uh, achieve our mission. I welcome any questions or uh, comments that you may have. Hi. Oh, this Deborah is Parade. Oh, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll ask a quick question. 
<laughs> um, with the youth grant makers, um, what does that entail? Um, so, sometimes I do speak to students in Winston-Salem. A lot of times it's outside of Winston-Salem, just in case I do end up speaking to a group. Um, what would that entail? Because I'm sure it's only for those in Forsyth County. Um, it is for students in Forsyth County. It is um, a, a program that lasts an academic year. So it starts in the fall and it runs through the spring. And it's an opportunity for interested students to um, learn more about philanthropy. They also do some fundraising together. And then they um, decide um, where they want to direct the dollars that they've raised. So it's also a really great opportunity for them to learn about the nonprofit sector, to learn about the many different kinds of organizations that are working to serve young people throughout our community. And then they get to determine, um, they review grant applications and they get to determine where the dollars that they have raised will be directed to. So it's a phenomenal opportunity, I think, to um, engage young people, um, not only in understanding more about the social sector, but also um, talking with people who are looking to serve them about ways that they can serve them better, um, which I think is um, a phenomenal part of the program. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, so this is Deborah Perret. As a longtime resident of uh, Winston-Salem and a member of the nonprofit community for about 30 years here, I'm very familiar with your work and have great respect for all the initiatives and the wonderful people at the Winston Salem Foundation. So um, my question to you specifically, Latita, is um, what tickled your fancy about Winston Salem? And, and, and tell us a little bit more about you and why you are here for us. Yeah, so I am, um, what tickled my fancy, did you say about Winston-Salem or about the foundation or both? Both, yeah. Um, so when it comes to the, so I'll start with the foundation and then I'll talk about the community. So um, I had really begun my career in health philanthropy. So I worked for foundations that were established when nonprofit hospitals were sold. So it's a very different kind of a, organization. There are no donors. Um, it's just the endowment of the foundation. And it was my responsibility um, to give the money away wisely to meet the health needs of the community. And that was valuable work that I truly enjoyed. Um, but the part of the work that I enjoyed the most was really the part about engaging deeply with the community. And in a private foundation, in a health um, legacy Foundation, engaging with the community is something that you do if you are smart because it helps you to make, to do better grant making, but it's a very different kind of equation when you're with a community foundation, when you are working with um, donors, when you are working with a community who has ownership over the foundation and its work. It's a very different kind of an experience, and so I was really excited about working someplace um, for which community engagement was non-negotiable, that it was our reason for being, and it was truly how we thought about philanthropy. And so um, I was excited to consider a community foundation for that reason. And in particular, excited to consider the Winston-Salem Foundation because community engagement has been a core way in which we've prioritized doing our work. This foundation has a deep commitment to racial equity that wasn't just established last year. It was established many, many years ago. They've done deep learning around what that means and how it relates to how we um, operationalize our work as a foundation. And so to me, it felt like this was the kind of place where I could really do philanthropy in the way that I think that it should be done. And so I was excited to be a part of that. And then when it came to the community, I mentioned that I, my husband and I have two children. Our son, Walter, is 11, and our daughter, Clark, is eight. And so um, they were both born in Cleveland, but we moved to Scranton when they were really little. And so they spent a lot of their formative years in Northeast Pennsylvania. And there are a lot of beautiful things about Northeast Pennsylvania. Um, and I'm grateful that they had the opportunity to be there. But we knew that as they were growing up, we wanted them to grow up in a different kind of community, that it mattered to me that they saw teachers and physicians and other people in power who looked like them. It also mattered to me that um, they were in a vibrant community that had access to the arts and beautiful play spaces 
and um, just had a different kind of energy to it. And so to us, we were able to find all those things here in Winston-Salem. And the icing on the cake for me is that my great grandmother is from Winston-Salem. So that was one of the other reasons why it felt just um, like we were meant to be here. Uh, she actually moved from Winston-Salem to Cleveland around the time the foundation was established, around the time that a lot of African-American folks were moving north. And so it felt amazing for me to have the opportunity to return here some 100 years later um, to find a better opportunity for my family and for my career. What a heartwarming connection that is. Wow, that's really full circle that you got to come back. Kevin, I see your message in the chat about your interest in um, participatory grant making models. I'd love the opportunity to connect you with Andrea Hulligan who oversees our strategic initiative so she can tell you more about how we do that in very different ways through our women's fund, through black philanthropy and through Youth Grant Makers in Action. I also had the opportunity before the holidays to tour UNCSA. It is an amazing place. Um, I spent two hours there and felt like I could have spent two days there. Um, it was just, uh, it's a jewel in our community and I was delighted to have the opportunity to learn about the amazing work that's happening on your campus. Well, and I believe you met with Chancellor Cole while you were at. He had mentioned that, that he had a visit with you. So, um, uh, lots to follow up on, and, uh, and and thank you. Anyone else want to jump in? <clears throat> I know some of you had specific things you were looking for from the conversation today. One other thing I want to add, Andrea, if I can, is that in addition to, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have um, about the foundation and welcome your connection with us, but I'm also really interested in hearing if there are other things happening in the community that you are excited about, because I am also very much in the stage right now of looking to become more involved myself as I get acclimated to our region. And so if there are exciting efforts that you're engaged in that align with our work, please do feel free to share those as well. Um, this is Deborah. I do have a follow on. So thanks for all that joyous and wonderful um, connection. And it's good to know about you and your family and your heritage, your, grand your great grandmother. Yes. Um, I know your time here is like five months or six months or so, uh, but what do you see as immediate top two or three things that really call out to your heart or your mind as things that need we need to all be paying attention to. And then I'm going to be quiet. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that I found, Deborah, thanks for that question, is that, um, you know, I came in and I knew very clearly what the foundation's priorities were and what the areas were that we had um, set for our work over the next five years. And I was really interested in seeing how much those priorities resonated um, with community members today. So we set those priorities in like 2018 and a lot has changed in our community and our world since then. And so I was really interested in, you know, as I've been having conversations like these with a whole range of folks, understanding if education and um, inclusive economies are the areas that um, other folks in the community would prioritize. And again and again and again, what I've heard is that those are absolutely um, not only the biggest challenges for our community, but also where people from across our community, I mean, when I spoke with our sheriff, I mean, even he talked about seeing economic um, mobility and education as being the greatest opportunities for our community. And so I feel really encouraged that um, the areas that we've landed on are the areas where we need to be. Certainly, I think that those challenges have become much more tough in recent years because of the disparities that COVID has just exacerbated. Um, but I'm excited about our work. 
Um, recognizing that it's incremental work, right? Like when I think about our work advancing um, equity in the school district, that is long, hard work. And it's not gonna happen in one school year or with one grant, um, no matter how smart or how big it is. But I think that our commitment to being there for the long haul, to building relationships and really thinking about what it takes at the present moment to make some headway on these big issues that are so vital to us is one of the most important roles we can play. Latita, I have absolutely loved listening to you talk about your passion for Winston-Salem. Um, I've mentioned that I am uh, I grew up here. I've been here a little over 15 years. So I wasn't born here, but I did grow up here. So this city is very important to me personally, on a personal level. And uh, I heard you mention a lot of things about working with students and getting scholarships and trying to close any gaps so that they have, there's equal opportunity for everyone. And something that I've noticed um, as a rapidly approaching 30 female um, in Winston-Salem is we have obviously great universities and colleges and schools all throughout the triad area. Um, but something that weighs hard on my worry scale is um, having job placement for people out after school so to encourage our students that are attending Wake Forest, Winston-Salem State, Salem College, School of the Arts, that they don't have to go anywhere else and that we have that here. Is the Winston-Salem Foundation involved in any initiatives um, like that? Um, so there's nothing that immediately comes to my mind that I've heard recently. But again, this is one of those wonderful places where if my colleagues know something I don't, please feel free to chime in. Um, but certainly one of the things I have had the great opportunity to do, Erin, since I arrived is meet with um, the presidents of Salem College and Wake Forest and Forsyth Tech and talk about uh, where we see our common interests. And certainly um, we've talked a lot together about um, how we might all work to support the um, Winston-Salem Forsyth County School District because we all have feel a shared responsibility to ensuring its success. And then also talk about how we might better position um, young people for um, employment on the, on the other end. I mean, certainly institutions like Forsyth Tech have always seen that as a considerable part of the work that they're doing. But I'm also excited about the work that's happening at Salem College and how they are transforming their curriculum to really prioritize women in health careers, recognizing that that is a significant need here in Forsyth County and throughout the community. And they're one of the, I don't know if they're one of the first or one of the few women's colleges to state that as a primary focus. So I certainly think that it's um, something that are on the radars of a lot of folks who are in leadership um, positions now, even though I can't immediately think of an investment the foundation may have made in that vein. Thank you so much. Latina, one spinoff of that, I don't know if you wanted to talk about our mission aligned investment at all and the most recent one we had to support um, black owned businesses that equilibrium I, it might be getting in the weeds it's not exactly college placement but it isn't an invest a, a new way that we're investing in the community yeah so cc references our mission line investments and that's a way that we um instead of using our grant dollars that we actually use our investment dollars so how um, we think about um growing our resources in the community to specifically um support um, for-profit um, groups that are working to build um, minority businesses. And so um, that is one of the um, newer ways that we have um, thought about bringing not only the foundation's grant dollars, but also its investment dollars to help serve our mission. Thanks, Cece. I have a follow-up question on that one, if that's okay. Sure. So I know in the last few years, there's been a lot of growth in using donor advised funds for impact investing. 
Um, I know that's something that's not happening at present at the Winston-Salem Foundation, but myself and Adrian Smith, who obviously is the, the, the contact with Equilibrium, had had lots of conversations with you know, foundation members over the last couple of years on what that could look like to get started. Um, so I'm just curious um, if there's an update on any of that movement, as that being an opportunity for um, you know, donor advised funds that are held by family. So instead of the foundation being the decision maker on that inv impact investment, but actually being able to utilize the platform um, to make some of those um, investments as well, um, just because some of the benefits and I, I'm sure you could explain it better than I can, but I, I, I'm sure there's others who maybe would be curious of knowing what that pass through actually looks like for the experience of a donor advised fund holder and how they can impact the community. So something I'm really passionate about in my day-to-day -day work and know in the last three years or so with the kind of the IRS change um, of information, there's an enormous opportunity for um, money held within donor advised funds to actually invest in the community versus just distribute um, charitably. So with, I'll, yeah, I'll shut up and listen. No, thank you so much for that question, Stephen. And the answer is not yet but we were actually in a conversation last week because this is we know that this is something that our donors are increasingly asking us to think about. And we're just not set up to do that yet, um, but, but we're working on it because um, we mission aligned investing is something that's new to the foundation. So we are just learning how to make these kinds of investments and getting our feet wet, understanding um, the kind of work that it takes because um, it's a different way of doing work than we are traditionally designed to do. Um, but we've heard from multiple donors now that it's something that they would be interested in um, participating in. And so we have to figure out what that will means, how we would structure those kinds of um, relationships. But it's certainly on our radar because we know that um, especially for a lot of um, newer donors, it's just an important way that they are interested in um, activating their um, their resources to support the community. Yeah. And then and it, often it gives access to capital for organizations that would not otherwise have it, which is in direct alignment with the foundation's mission. And does it feel like the challenge thus far is more around just wrapping your, wrapping your collective arms around what would be a big project and a big shift or is it you know technology limitations thus far like what why do you feel like you know someone like franklin templeton or charity you know fidelity charitable or some of the law are they wrapping their arms around it because that they're just bigger and they have more technology at hand or um or, yeah i'm just kind of curious there in ways that we in the community who care about that as well can can help within that effort because you're exactly right. Like, you know, working in the wealth management space, we have clients all the time that want to open donor advised mm -hmm. funds and they're actually bringing it up to us saying, hey, I've heard about this impact investing thing. If I opened one at the Winston-Salem Foundation, could I do that, you know, or should I use someone else? And so I want to always be able to say, no, use the Winston-Salem Foundation and invest that you want because they want to invest in this community, right? They don't want to invest in Cleveland or Boston or wherever. So yeah, would love to hear about that. Yes, and we want, to invest, we want them to invest in this community as well. And it's not, I, I don't think at this point that it's a problem of technology. It's not a problem of, it's just a problem that we have not yet um, determined the right approach for. I mean, it is something that um, I would have to say that in the past couple of months, um, we've just begun hearing that this is something that our donors um, have an interest in. And so, um, it's just a matter of taking the time and figuring out how we would um, structure um, an opportunity like that. Um, we just haven't, and how that would align with the foundation's um, investment policy statement. I mean, it's just a matter of figuring out um, those kinds of checks and balances, but it's not um, that we've run into any stumbling blocks. It's just something that we need to um, figure out but it is cer certainly something that we have a priority um, to, to think about. And so I welcome the opportunity to circle back with you yeah. on the progress we're making. Thank you so much. Yeah, just to follow up, is there something we can do to help with that process? Um, I think that you telling us that it's important to you is helping. 
um, because um, initially um, hearing it from one or two donors, not that that isn't enough, but um, we, I don't, I don't know if we uh, fully appreciated the um, energy that this has. And so um, you're helping me to appreciate that. And so we can certainly um, talk more with um, internally and with our board around how we might make opportunities like that available. I don't think that we fully appreciate it, um, how much um, interest there would be. Do you mind if I just explain for like 30 seconds that, sure. that the way the vehicle is actually used? Yeah. Uh, Andrea and I have talked about this a number of different times on these calls. Sometimes each of us in our collective experiences come to these conversations and there's certain assumptions we make on what people know. Mm -hmm. And so I always love like not doing that. So donor advised fund in essence is um, established honestly, similarly to like a not-for-profit. So if you like had a large business sale or you had stock that was held in, that you held personally um, that had grown in value, right? That had like a large capital gain you would gift it to that donor advised fund that's held in your name or your family's name. You actually receive uh, the tax benefit, like if you gave to the United Way from having given to that donor advised fund, that donor advised fund is held typically at somewhere like the Winston-Salem Foundation or Fidelity or Franklin Templeton or lot, lots of other, you know, whatever. Then over, you then at that point have that large amount of money that you've put in there that can either be sold, right? Like if it's a bunch of stock that's grown, it can be sold. That's, um, you, you don't realize those capital gains, which is good. That's beneficial if, if that's helpful in your tax situation. Then over a period of time that doesn't have to be in that same year, you can make grants out of that donor advice fund. This is the traditional use, grants out of that donor advice fund to charities of your choice, qualifying 501c3s. About three years ago, the IRS, became comfortable with impact investing being a way that money could be distributed from that donor advised fund. I think the challenge that I've, that I've talked a lot with Adrian about is you don't have an IRS tax code that qualifies what is an impact investment. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know that that's a challenge for you all because you're the record keeper of who those distribute to and the buck stops with you on if you've actually allowed your donor advised fund holders to do something that is that truly meets the criteria of impact investing, which is still a little gray, <laughs> depending on where you're reading about it. Whereas if you're either a 501c3 or you're not, right? So if you distribute from your donor advised fund to the United Way or the Flywheel Foundation, it qualifies because the IRS sees their, you know, their tax ID number. And so that being said, though, the cool thing about impact investing is if you if you invest in a local small business that qualifies and that small business actually has a return, um, that return goes back into the donor advised fund. So if they return on your investment, it goes back into the donor advised fund. And if it's grown, then you have more within that donor advised fund to then give out into your community, which could go to charity, could go um, to another, you know, back to that same business, to a different business. So it's super fascinating. I think people who have... Um, uh, a more entrepreneurial startup appetite, they want that, um, right? They've received the same charitable benefit for their own personal taxes when they put money in the donor advised fund. But when they think about solving problems within their community, they actually want the money to go to those who are in their mind, you know, more entrepreneurial problem solving versus at times, you know, the traditional, you know, kind of charity vehicle and so I think there's a balance for both, but yeah, I kind of got long-winded there, but I get super excited about it because I think it's a real, um, to steal a uh, flywheel. It, it, it will have a flywheel effect in our community if the foundation can figure out being that place where people can come to, because, um, you know, as we grow as a community in our uh, kind of gut around startup investing, there are so many people in our community who are more traditional investors that have been very philanthropic to the foundation. And anytime they give to the foundation, the, they're giving because they care about their community, but also there's a tax benefit of having done so in a, lot of, in a lot of situations. So if we can accomplish the tax benefit part on the upfront and help do some education on how they can invest back in their community 
that has like a little bit kind of more growth multiplier effect within those small businesses. I think it gets to Aaron's question around job retention. It gets to a lot of what we're talking about in terms of passion there. So um, yeah, keep, keep it up. It's, it's important. So let's see that this is Deborah again. I have a question about uh, just for people who might not be aware. Um, I've known the Winston Foundation for a long time and I've worked with some nonprofits who have uh, been beneficiaries of grants from there. But um, how, so you have do a pool of donor advised funds and more that will grow as people choose to do this. How are those donor advised funds matched with uh, community need? So that would just be a question. I would sort of the mechanics of that. So donor advised funds are directed by the donors. And so donors can determine that they are interested in supporting a specific organization. They can determine that they're interested in supporting an area of interest like the arts or the environment. They can determine that they are interested in supporting the work of the foundation as the foundation might prioritize. So truly donors have the discretion to direct their dollars in any way that they would prioritize. And we are happy to work with a wide variety of donors who share a wide variety of interests. So that even as the foundation is prioritizing um, equity in education and inclusive economies, there's also a considerable amount of donor directed funds that are going to the arts or that are going to healthcare because these also support um, a healthy community. We work to educate our donors on the work of the foundation so that donors would have an interest in aligning their um, funding with the foundation's priorities so that they might either choose to directly contribute dollars to the foundation's unrestricted funds or so that they might also work alongside of us to support the areas that we care about. But donor, direct, donor advised funds are always directed um, in the ways that donors prioritize. I have a question, not to, um, I know we're all sick of talking about COVID. <laughs> I know we are. I just um, have spent so much time um, over the past couple of years as, as someone who, who spent COVID trying to hold together a membership um, a business that's thoroughly based on not working from home, <laughs> so uh, which which was challenging. And what came out of that was was listening to all of the individual stories of how they pivoted, how they adjusted, how they overcame um, in their own organizations and in small businesses, especially and entrepreneurs and startup companies, um, to to survive and in many cases thrive um, throughout the entire collective experience. So I am curious, and this might be since you've been with us for five months uh, where some other folks can chime in, is what was the effect of COVID on the foundation? And what was the effect um, you know, from a giving standpoint of, of the entire experience? And what were the biggest challenges to overcome and what are things you're still over? You know, I still have a list of we've, we've overcome this and this, but we still have these things to go. And so what, um, what do you still have to work on to, to get kind of not back to normal, but the new normal? Um, so I would start by saying, I mean, we are really fortunate in our community. We saw a significant increase in giving last year, a considerable increase in um, grants made last year um, because very generous people across our community recognized that um, this was a moment where we needed to dig deep and really look to support um, our neighbors in addressing the pandemic. And so in that way, um, the foundation really saw um, an increase in our work last year in response to COVID. And certainly right now, we recognize that our community has an influx of um, public resources that are supporting our education system, that are supporting small businesses, that are supporting um, the community in multiple ways to recover, um, hopefully as the pandemic is ending. Um, and we recognize a need to continue to be a steadying force throughout that, to continue to 
target the priorities that we've targeted. So we worked last year with partners to address um, did access to um, internet, recognizing that that was a particular challenge um, exacerbating inequities in education last year. Um, and so I think that, you know, we've been very grateful with the support our community has received um, in response to COVID. And we recognize that the recovery will be long-term. Thank you. And there is a question in the uh, chat to tell us more about the volunteer opportunities. You touched on um, reviewing student, student scholarships, what all is involved in that time commitment and how to get involved and what other opportunities might there be. Yes, so I, I mentioned that there are multiple ways to become involved, certainly our um, Strategic initiatives are ways that people can become involved. Um, our Women's Fund, our Black Philanthropy Initiative, we welcome partners in those efforts. And then um, scholarship reviewers are always a place where we welcome community members who wanna be involved in the foundation's work. Um, as speaking specifically about time commitments, I'm actually not certain of because I have yet to experience it at the foundation. It's actually going to happen this spring. I don't know if any of my colleagues who are on the line would have more information about timeline or SCCC. You came off mute. Yeah, um, I have participated before. It is not a big time commitment, and I believe we're expanding our numbers even uh, by inviting more people in. Um, I, I, I can't remember if it was even five hours or, or something. I usually there's a, an orientation training with the group. I'm not sure if they're still doing it this way. And then you're, you're basically assigned applications to review. You're given a, um, a grid on which to evaluate it. And then, uh, collect, you're not the only person reviewing. There's a collective, uh, uh, mathematical way behind it. So it's not a huge time commitment, um, but we'd be happy. I think it's Brittany that is taking those. So I'll post uh, Brittany Gasbury in, in the chat who you can reach out to if, if you're interested. Um, I know recently she put, she put out the word that they would welcome more. So I'll do that right now. In addition to that, um, it's done. Rem the the work is done remotely, and you review um, the applications for for students and um, to, for for scholarships and and merit and need, and then you rate them on a system online. So it's really easily done from from your location. He says, Brittany, the right person for that. I wanted Brittany, to make sure. Brittany or Kisa. So it is 1239 and, and we've been on here a long time and I let everybody be respectful of everyone's time and let them get back to work. Um, sled riding, hopefully it's melting out there so I can go to the office, but... Uh, <laughs> I am, I am, I do love a work from home day, uh, but like many of our members, a little bit goes a long way and then I want to get back to the office. Um, so does anyone else have any questions for anyone? There's a new message. Oh, that's easy. Anyone else? A question for Latita or anyone on her team? Not a question, but just like Minnie, thank you so much. I, I've had some pre private chats with folks during the call here, not to bombard the chat, but I, I really appreciate being in community with you all uh, today. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to more ways to partner and connect with you all uh, in your organizations in the year to come. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks, Latita. And we are too. Yep. Thank, thank you for coming. Um, if anyone has further questions about Flywheel, we 
love to have you come and take a tour. Um, we will be um, working diligently on our foundation activities as well with Stephen and Rick and others. Um, and we're in the process of looking for a new executive director. I'm allowed to say that, right? So <laughs> we are, that has been announced. Um, not formally yet, but we are um, in a transition right now, a very exciting one. And so we're really looking forward to 2022 and what that brings. We're really proud to, um, to, to know that Flywheel is more than a co-working space. I know that's how people view us right off, but through our foundation, we offer programming and support for startup startups and entrepreneurs. We've really expanded in the last couple of years beyond just startup companies or tech startups. That's kind of how we started out and have responded to the needs, um, expanding needs over the years and now have, um, have programs for entrepreneurs of all kinds. Many folks in the entrepreneurship ecosystem, um, Agile City, Center for Creative Economy are located within Flywheel. Um, and then we have others, of course, who are um, like Kevin, who are in 500 West 5th Street with us the Center for Private Business, um, and lots of other resources for entrepreneurs at 500 West 5th Street. And so we're looking forward to 2022, to getting to know our neighbors in 500 um, better. Now that COVID is over, we moved in um, December 1st of 2019. And so we were there for a full three months, expanding and growing our membership. And then, you know, we all know what happened. So um, we're looking forward to seeing our neighbors again and getting out hopefully um, at least kind of in the spring a little bit more to commune with you um, and develop face-to-face -face relationships. Thank you for um, doing another Zoom meeting today and joining us. Thank you, Latita, for joining us and all of your information. We wanna welcome you again to Winston-Salem and we can't wait to see um, what you do. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. Okay. Thanks, Andrea. Good to see everybody. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.